my turn. So this morning we're going to continue the series that I've been doing on non-dual awareness and today's topic specifically is on karma. And, and so we're going to take a look quickly at karma and how it serves us in our effort to kind of try on the, the perspective of non-dual reality that we're invited to realize as a state of being not as a mental model, but we, in our progress towards recognizing it as our true nature, we need a way to be able to think about it and approximate it and uh, have a target to orient towards. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to see if we can get a, a sense of the non-dual state as the the idea of karma invites us to. And then we're going to spend some time just talking about karma itself and, and how we can use that idea in our practice as we uh, move towards self-understanding, self-realization, and, and the non-dual perspective. So one of the things that fascinates me about karma, and it, and it, and it indeed is one of my favorite topics, uh, both how it's held in the, the traditional teachings, you know, kind of in the historic Dharma, um, I find fascinating, but also how we hold it in kind of our culture today and how this idea that is ancient seems very prevalent in our modern American culture. And there are so many different aspects of the traditions that aren't, you know, that seem very uh, kind of odd or uh, conspicuous in their absence, yet this idea of karma um, seems to have made it. And, you know, the two examples that come to mind are, are you know, the two network TV shows that were based on this idea of karma and, and brought it into our homes. And to me, that's a, that's a pretty high bar when, when something becomes such a kind of ubiquitous uh, uh, consumer culture that, that it must resonate with us in some way. So, so there's that idea of karma, that we all kind of have some sense of it, whether it's something that we've spent much time studying we all have an internal sense of it, and if asked, we could answer. And, and we'd probably you know, be really similar and, and have a, a reasonable approximation of what it is. Um, so I want to take a moment and kind of look at that. And so uh, in some ways, the, our sense of, of karma is that it's a system of merit and demerit. You know, it's a bit of the, the Santa Claus approach, right? The naughty and nice list. And if you've been nice enough, you're going to get something good. And if you've been bad enough, you're not going to get something good, right? And so we have that version of it. And then um, we also have, we could say similar, uh, within the, the Christian tradition of if you're good, you go to heaven. And if you're bad, you go to hell. So again, we have this idea of a somebody, some place, is keeping track of how we're doing. And if we're being good or nice, then there's a reward in it for us. And for many of us, this kind of runs the gambit of our sense of karma. You know, this is it. It's, it's this list of merit and demerit. And, and so the, the net result is uh, an, an effort to the degree that we take it seriously at all, an effort to be good, to get a reward, right? So, you know, that's mildly helpful, maybe. Um, and we don't necessarily need to throw that away, but I, I do think, you know, there is, there's a lot more to the original uh, science, the, you know, from the traditions, the, the understanding of karma gives us a lot more to work with than just that idea. Yeah. So, if we you know, talk about that a little bit, uh, there is, so there's the sense of karma and its relationship to action, so what we do, and in the traditions, action isn't just a uh, physical action in the world, right? So they always kind of put together um, action, 
uh, thought and speech. So it's not just kind of what you do physically, but it's everything that arises in you is considered under this category of action. So even what you think or intend, uh, what you say, what you do, these all kind of come under this idea, this, this law of karma. So there is that part of it, which is true enough, that, that it is about action, and that your actions have consequences, and that one ought to pay attention to that. You know, it's just kind of good advice. But there's another side to it that is the, the moral side. Right? So um, sometimes it is called the, you know, the moral law of action. Right? And bringing these two pieces together of, of not just consequences, which I might take more personally just for myself, but also kind of this moral quality. And, and it brings them together, and then there's a whole teaching around what about that. Right? And then, you know, within karma, a conversation about karma often very quickly goes to something related to this, the idea of reincarnation, right? So it moves across the idea of this lifetime and into other lifetimes, right? And for some people, that's not a belief that they choose to hold, which is fine. And I think you can still learn a lot and, and uh, gain from the understanding of karma without having to believe in past lives. That's perfectly fine. But to the degree that that often comes up, and, and many of us may have that kind of relationship to it, it extends into this idea of what has happened in past lives that might be affecting me in this life, and what might I be doing in this life that will affect me in future incarnations. So this idea that it, it passes beyond merely the window of time of, of this particular life. And so that is also kind of a, a current cultural belief that I think is worth looking at and holding in a broader perspective. Right? So, so these are the, the pieces that I want you to have in your mind that that whether it's something explicitly through karma, if that's the the word that you use internally, the, the uh, model that you have, or just some other, you know, more of a, a moral code, uh, an idea of, of merit and demerit. But, so having that in mind, right, we want to take a look at this from the perspective of non-dual reality, right? So we have this idea that what I do did in a past life affects me in this life. Right. And maybe you've heard somebody or you yourself have done some work relative to a past life and you have a sense of, because this happened to me in a past life, this is what's happening to me in this life. Right. And we can easily translate this to something happened to me early in my life, right, maybe 20 years ago, and that thing that happened 20 years ago is still affecting me now. Right? So the same idea of, of consequences through time, even if we take away this, you know, the, the break of lifetimes, we, this, the concept is the same, right? The relationship to it is the same. So we have this idea as, a, as, a, as an individual ego, as a separate self. We have this idea of me existing through time and experience happens to me and then there is some consequence from that that I am uh, at the mercy of, right? And then we tend, as egos, to suffer this, right? We have concerns and worries and despair and sorrow relative to this, right? Whatever it has happened, I want it to be different. How come this happened to me? What can I do to make it not the case? We relate to it in this way, right? We take it very personal. So the non-dual perspective, of course, invites us to consider this option, right, of that we're not separate, right? That there is not a separate self. There is no me to which life is happening, right? So if we really step into that and hold that perspective of there is only true nature, right? There is only true nature arising, and I just happen to be part of that arising, right? One place 
in which true nature is arising, but it is ari that same true nature is arising equally all around me. And as the very circumstance that, that I and everybody and everything else find themselves in, right? So this idea of kind of the oneness, the continuity of everything, the unity, right? So if we step into that and we really think about this, there is only one, then this idea of karma and consequence really falls apart quickly because who, there is no one that something is happening to and not happening to. There is no good fortune in one place and misfortune in another place. Right? There is no you coming into existence later because of what happened before and that it could be different. Right? None of that isn't, is at all even conceivable if there is just true nature arising. Right? So from that perspective, right, there, the whole idea of karma is just an illusion. More than that, it's a delusion. Right? It's a delusion that can only arise and pertain in the mind of the separate self. Right? So in the moment of forgetting your separateness right, or remembering your wholeness, then you recognize that all of the mind that you had around merit and demerit and if, it, if I can do the right thing, things will go well for me and I, I'll get a reward. None of it makes any sense from that perspective. Right? It can't. I mean, it's, it's impossible. Right? So, by relating to our sense of karma, one of the things that comes from it is whenever it arises, we know that we are our separate self. In that moment, I am being and taking myself to be my ego. And, and if you do nothing else, and I actually suggest you do nothing else other than notice in that moment that you are taking yourself to be separate. And the, and the practice, the instruction, right, in the non-dual schools, right, in, a, in, say, in Vedanta, the main school that I've been using kind of to base these talks on, the, the only instruction is stop it, right? Stop the activity of taking yourself to be separate. That's all you have to do is just notice that you're doing it, and in the noticing that you're doing it, quit doing it. And you might say, but what do I do? The actual answer is nothing. But the separate self has a really hard time doing nothing. So just open yourself to the question of what is my other option at this point in time? Right? If you just open yourself to the field of what else could I do, it creates the invitation to recognize non-doing. Right? you can take your attention away from the activity that you're doing in the moment and just look up and open up to another possibility, it creates the opportunity to notice non-doing as an option. Right? But as long as you maintain your investment in the doing, then you can't recognize that opportunity. Right? So this is one of the ways we can use the idea of karma as a doorway to the non-dual realization. Right? In that most of us, at some point in the day, have mind that is arising in this, this way of the, the, this, this concept, this model of, of karma. We're reflecting on our behavior or another's behavior, and we're making some type of moral assessment about it, its rightness or its wrongness, its appropriateness or its inappropriateness. And in the moment of doing that, we are enacting our separateness. Right. So that's, that really is the, is the, the ultimate teaching around karma from the non-dual perspective. That there is no karma that there is no karma, 
and that we're deeply invested in the belief that there is and, and the activity associated that arises from that belief. And as always, the instruction from the non-dual perspective is stop. Whatever you're doing, stop it. Because that very activity, whatever the activity is, that activity itself is the thing keeping you from being. Right? You can't do being. Being is already your circumstance. It's the doing that is taking you away from it, not allowing you to notice that it's already the case. Right? So this is just one of a multitude of opportunities that we have one that we're talking about today. So that said, now we're going to take some time and actually talk about karma as a way to engage in it that is more helpful until you can actually stop engaging in it. Right? So there is a way that we can be with it that is more helpful than less helpful. But keeping in mind, no matter what I say and how maybe, maybe intelligent and applicable it seems, right? You might have a sense of like, oh, that's a really good idea. I'm going to do that, right? Remember, the main instruction is stop it. Don't do anything. Not even the really good suggestion that I might make, right? But if you can't remember to stop it, try and remember to have the, the more helpful orientation, right? What's that? I think that is a great thing to contemplate. It's like a Zen koan. Yep. <laughs> so, this idea of how do we, you know, how do we use karma as a, as a way out, right? If the main instruction is just stop, there's nothing to do, but yet there's something to do, the paradox of practice, right? So I've been trying to think of what's, a, what's a, an analogy we can use. And so we could say that if, if in, within the traditions, the goal is self-realization, right? To, to recognize your inherent true nature, right? To recognize that you always already are, right? That it's not some place you're going, but you're already there now. There's nothing you can do, right? So this idea that, that uh, of, of being old, right? Of course, this becomes tricky. What is old? Right? So we, we could. So I'm going to say a hundred, right? Is old. But it happens to be that I, I have a friend who's 103, and and she does not feel old. She's recently said she's going to make it to 106. She's sure of it. And indeed, there's nothing about her that seems old. She is vital and full of will, and every day is a day of for her, of commitment to being more, of, 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 of bettering herself. It's impressive, right? She could eat bacon and nap. I mean, it would be okay. It's like, you're 103, you're off the hook. But no, she is still going strong. But for our purposes here, since I don't think there are any 100-year-olds here, or even any 90-year-olds here, we're going to say 100 is old. So wherever we are in our own process, we could say, there's a hundred, right? That's, that's old. And my goal is, is to be old, right? So what can you do today to be a hundred? Right? Nothing, right? It's not a thing that you can do to be a hundred today. What about, you know, the things we've been taught to take care of your body, get enough sleep, get good nutrition? Yes, exactly. So what can you do? You can optimize not dying. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what you can do. Right? But there isn't anything you can do. I mean, just you could just close your eyes and muster all your will. And it, and it will 
do nothing for you. Right? So this is a similar perspective when we say around self-realization that there's nothing that you can do. Right? But what you can do, and this is what the traditions bring to us, is exactly what you've said. They bring to us the, the things that we can do to eliminate the barriers to recognizing what's already the case. Right? So just like we can eat better and exercise more and, and have you know, good relationships and do all the things that they're telling us that seem to work. Science seems to say you do these things and you'll live longer. And not just longer, but, but the years that you have will be better, right? So if we do those as it really is an effort not to die. That's all we can do, right? We, we do that as, as an effort to not have the thing that we don't want to have happen happen. Right? And so spiritual practice is the same way. Right? We don't practice to be enlightened. Right? You can't do it. But you can practice to take away all of the things that are in the way of, of your knowing that you are already enlightened. Right? So it's, it's really a practice of the negative. It's a, it's a doing towards not doing. It's a doing to let go of. Right? It's a doing to avoid. Right? So that's our, that's our activity. And just like we could say with our, um, our practice, our goal of being a hundred, that there are better and worse ways to do that. Right? There are better and worse ways to eat. There are better and worse ways to exercise. There are better and worse ways to be in relationship with people and build community, right? So it's the same thing within today our talk about karma, right? This idea that there are better and worse ways to be as a person. And, and really that's all the science of karma is inviting us to, is to this understanding that there are better and worse ways to be and, and then a suggestion of like, hey, how about you try the ways that seem to be about being better? Just a suggestion. Like, what if you put your effort into that? Right? The quest for holding the question of how could I be better? Right? So uh, in the tradition, they talk about uh, ahimsa, right? Nonviolence, non-harming, right? So this is a big one in the area of karma, right? And so th one can bring that question, right? Like how how can I do less harm, right? And and just look into that and just see just little ways, little ways. What what can you do? What how can you understand more? Just the impact that you have as a human being, right? And where is that impact seeming to the best of your ability to understand, right? Where is that impact positive, right? Where does it seem helpful, supportive, facilitative of life? And where does it seem to be less so? Right? And so the tradition of karma says, do more of the things that bring you to have a more supportive impact on life. Do less of the things that seem to have a negative impact on life. All right? And again, we can get pulled into the idea that I'm doing this to get someplace. I am doing this for a reward. The ego pretty quickly take a few steps down this this path, and the ego pretty quickly will be, will start to put up a fuss of like, why am I doing this? Why, why, you know, these things that I'm not doing because I've decided they have an, a negative impact or they're a less optimal impact. I like them, and I want to do it, right? So the ego will have that perspective and and begins to kick up a fuss. And in order to keep doing it, we have a sense of we need a reward. Like, what's my payoff for this? Right. 
And, and the ego doesn't do well with you know, the negative, right? With the, the senses we've talked about. We, we eat better to try not to die. Well, that's not anything the ego can get its hands on and have, right? And it doesn't like that. It wants the goods. It wants to have the goods. It doesn't want to just not have a consequence that it can't relate to, right? That may never have manifested. It wants something tangible. Right? So this is, this is what, what we have to deal with, right? So this is the struggle of, you know, what is called karma yoga. Right? Sometimes also called Kriya Yoga, both kind of translated as the yoga of action, yeah. but, but different in kind of the, the place inside of one it comes from. Right? The intention of where it arises from is different between the two. Karma Yoga Right? So just the practice of what we're talking about today, it's nothing fancy, right? It has nothing to do with postures or asanas or, or anything, right? It has to do with action and being mindful of the action, right? And again, action being action, speech, and thought, all of those, right? The action that you're taking. Where is it arising from in you? It's the first place you look, right? Where is it arising from in you? What's the need associated with it? What's the motivation? What's the drive behind that action? Right? So we start there. And then we can look. What's the impact of that? You know? And I have to bring my best self to bear on this. Right? What is the impact of that going to be on my life, on the life of others around me, on the planet? You know, life as a whole. We don't think of it just as a, a, another human being. Life as a whole. What's the impact of that? And I just want to—I want to open myself to ask those questions and to feel into it. Right. So what we tend to do around this is we want to make up a set of rules. We want to ten commandments. Like, just tell me how to be, and then I'll do my best to follow those rules. And then the promise is, if I follow the rules, then I go to heaven, right? I mean, that's the thing. If I follow the rules, I get the reward. But it's more complicated than that, right? Like our attempt to be a hundred, there is, unfortunately, no guarantee that if I eat well and exercise and have good relationships that I'm going to make it. And within that, we don't even know like, what is a good diet. Lord knows that the nutrition experts can't decide, right? So we have 4,000 books on, on nutrition, all those different diets. How do you know? Well, you, you have to use some intelligence and make some good initial decisions. And then you have to try it and see in your experience how does it go, right? So we call this, this discerning awareness, Right? And this is a progressive capacity that we have, discerning awareness. Right? So this is what we need to do in our practice of karma yoga. Right? We need to use our discerning awareness as we look at ourself and my own motivations and my drives as any particular action is arising. Right? And I look at that. And I do the best that I can in any moment. Right? And then you live your life. And then you look back on and you say, how did that go? Did it go the way I thought? And you let that feed back in and then repeat. And it's the commitment to doing that moment to moment. Right? What is my motivation? What's the impact of my action? Did it go the way I thought? What can I learn from this? How can I do it better next time? And it's the commitment to that that is karma yoga. Right? And so we do that with this in the background teaching and understanding that in any moment the invitation is to drop the whole thing. Drop the whole premise that, that there's a you 
and to them and that you're separate and that any of that activity matters. Right? But if you can't do that, then continue to practice your karma yoga. Right? So we have a slow and steady improvement. It's a process. You're engaged in the process. Part of the joke is the process thins right, the, the shell that is preventing you from seeing that it's already the case. Right? That the process itself is unnecessary. Right? So the process helps thin the shell. So while you're doing it, you're helping yourself. But in any moment, you want to be open to just dropping it all. Right? Seeing that un none of it is necessary. None of it is ultimately true. None of what I've just said is true or necessary from the perspective of non-dual awareness. Right? This happens in life. Right? We can relate to this in life to not make it quite as abstract. You, know, you, you can be on one side of a phase of life and you can feel the urgency and the necessity of what it is you need to do. Right? And you can feel that in your body and in your mind and your, the drive and you, you work through and maybe it's a 10 year phase of your life. And you get past it by a little bit. And you look back and often we laugh to ourselves at the silliness of the person who on the front side of all that was so bent out of shape, so wound up right, about whatever it was that we thought was so important and all the things we did to accomplish it only later to see that it really wasn't that important. And even if it was that important, it really wasn't helpful to get all that bent out of shape about it that wound up, right? This happens all the time. We hear this from people as they, you know, spend time in a hospice and you'll hear story after story after story as people reflect back on their life about how they didn't value what they now see as valuable, right? So it's just a guarantee that we're going to do this, right? So we can just take that model Right? Just take the, the understanding that that happens and bring that into your practice. Right? Help take the pressure off. Yeah. Oh, God, I need some help with something. I'm sitting here talk, listening to you, and I just realized that one of the lenses I view uh, life around me is through karma. Like, for example, I'm watching the news, and some atrocity will happen with two individuals. And I'm thinking, sitting there thinking, well, they had a date with destiny. There must have been some karma mm -hmm. that they needed to uh, to balance out. But you're saying there is no karma, so help me figure out a different way to you. Because <laughs> you just kicked that yeah. clutch that makes yeah. us think it's okay. Yes. Well, thank you for saying that, and you're welcome, and I'm sorry. <laughs> well, so one, one, well, uh, so that's a possibility for sure. Um, one of the things we might want to look at is one of the ways that, to look into the motivation again, right? So one of the ways we do this can be a sense of consolation or a way to console ourselves. Right? So, yeah, so that, so that this is a really common way that people use it, just as you described it. There are things that happen in the world that are uh, disconcerting to us. They disturb us. And so we need some kind of explanation to, to palliate our, di our, our uh, concern, right? How we feel our distress. And so if one has access to the idea of karma, that's a really handy one, to bring it in as a causal explanation for why this happened. I don't have to worry, right? And then, and so the practice of, is to just, to look into the motivation. And in seeing the motivation, that, that opens up to other possibilities, you know, to, to bring the wisdom of the teaching, to be like, oh, I'm using karma right now to console myself. How about if I just show up for myself and, and hold myself? If I just hold the one who's afraid? And I just do that. 
Uh, you know, so give it a shot and report back to us <laughs> how that goes. Yeah. So I do want to uh, take a moment and just talk quickly, and then I want you guys to do some exercises. So as much as I've said from the non-dual perspective, karma doesn't exist. For those of us who are not enlightened, karma does exist, right? In some simple forms, the idea of genetics, right? You have genes, and in your genes there are tendencies, right? Tendencies for you to turn out a certain way, and that happens, right? But now science has put forth this idea of epigenetics, right? That genes aren't determinative. Just because you have certain genes does not mean certain, you're going to only be a certain way. There's this idea that epigenetics, which is a number of things, but we say environment, context, mind, affect genetic expression, right? That's the idea. So that you can, you can have an effect on which genes express, right? So your genes, in a way, are karma. And what I love about the historic science of karma was that 5,000 years ago, they posited a theory that perfectly holds our now modern understanding of genetics, right? So then within psychology, there's a, a version of genetics, it's called memetics, which is how we inherit mind across generations, right? So really good science showing that this happens, right? So it, it, if you take a look at the science, all of a sudden it's not worth debating anymore because you just see it happens. And you probably don't even have to look at the science, you can just look in your own life to see how beliefs and kind of ways of being in the world are transmitted from generation to generation, right? And so we call that memetics, right? So your mind, you're, you're given patterns, and, and you'll have a tendency to follow those just unconsciously, but you also have the capacity to change that, right? And you, so it's not determinative. You can change it. So what karma gives us is an understanding, a conceptual understanding that holds genetics and holds memetics, but goes further than that, right? And so I take our modern understanding of genetics and memetics as confirmation that they weren't wrong 5,000 years ago, that they were onto something, and maybe it's worth paying attention to what they were trying to communicate to us. So it is helpful to work with this idea of karma, right? Personally, within yourself, right? It is helpful to do. Uh, it would be, it, it would be, um, it would be equally delusional to try and pretend that it doesn't exist, right? As a separate self, to reject the idea of karma would be delusional, right? Because it does pertain to the separate self. It doesn't pertain to the non-dual self. But until you're that, it applies, right? And in any moment that you're in touch with your true nature, right? So you don't have to wait until you're enlightened. You can have an enlightened moment in any moment of any day. You can be in touch with your true nature and, and living there. And in that moment, it doesn't apply. But in all the rest of the moments, it applies. Yeah? So I want to do some exercises. Get, try and get you in touch with this. So you're going to get in groups of two. You're going to do a repeating question. Um, there's a good number of folks here who have done this before. Um, so you might try and, if you've not done this, see if you can partner up with somebody who has, and they can kind of show you the ropes. So you guys go ahead and break into your groups of two, and then I'll give you the questions. Um, if you want, you can uh, write the questions down. Um, that can be helpful. But if you don't have, if you don't have something to write them down on, um, not not to worry. I'll give you the questions at the beginning of each exercise.